Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, everyone. Burt Whitlow here on the Break It Down Show with Pete Turner. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, 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 we're doing this thing. Bert and I were in the Army together. Matter of fact, we were in Delta Company 165th together. And I've been slowly over time bringing people from this company during this era of time on the show because we got to do something pretty remarkable when we deployed to Bosnia. We were just kind of talking about the basics of it. But it's neat because, uh, well, one, Bert, uh, at least when we were in the Army together, was a counterintelligence agent. He was a damn good one, too. So uh, we're going to get a chance to talk about just the job of being a counterintelligence agent, a human collector, whatever you want to call it. And I think you guys will enjoy this. It's a fun Friday show. Hey, Bert, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, appreciate uh, having me on. When we deployed to Bosnia, it wasn't a terribly dangerous place in retrospect. But going in, we didn't know that, did we? No, we didn't. Uh, it was the unknown. Uh, with uh, Right before we went in, we had the, uh, the Serbs line up uh, some individuals and do a uh, um, uh, mow them down, you know, in a, a firing line. So we thought we were going in, it was still hostile and, and things like that. But once we got there, it was pretty much calm as the American army was, as was moving into Bosnia. How new were you to the unit before we deployed? How long you'd been there? Three months. I came wow. in, I, I came in from Korea as my first assignment as a warrant officer. And I, and I uh, did a cot, uh, consecutive overseas tour. Uh, and then went into Germany in September, and I was in Bosnia by December of 95. One of the things that people don't understand, partly about our job, because our job is so weird, but also that the times had changed. Cold War was over. Uh, we were getting rid of our unit. It was like one of the last CI companies out there. And we were getting rid of all of our M16s. We were in the middle of that process. Everyone was going to have a nine mil. We were no longer going to have interrogators in the entire army at some point. Right. right? And then all of a sudden, we go on this tactical deployment. How, I mean, how different was that from you? What did you think you were getting into? And then three months later, when you realized, oh, I, we're actually going somewhere, how different was that for you? It, it was, it was, you know, I always thought I was going to Germany to enjoy Germany because um, I, before I went to Korea, I went to DLI to learn German. And then they sent, you know, of course, the Army's infinite wisdom, they sent me to Korea to learn more German. Right. Um, so I was, I was looking forward to going to Germany, speaking the language, and and touring Europe, uh, but that that those plans were put on hold because we uh, uh, Bosnia hit and we were sent to Bosnia. So yeah, I had no idea what I was getting into until I I came into the unit. Is that your one really tactical uh, deployment? Uh, I had a couple throughout my career, but that was my because uh, my very first assignment was Panama, so a brand new private in the army, and that's when Just Cause hit. So uh, the four, I was with the four seventieth when we were still in Panama, and so I had that, and then in Germany. Uh, and and then were was, you counterintelligence when you went to Panama, or were you doing something? No, I, yeah, I joined. I joined off the street as a counterintelligence agent. So back in the day, it was a B10 program where mm -hmm. a counterintelligence agent's assistant was actually an MOS in the army at that time. Uh, so what they did was they sent you to school the very first, uh, or half the class, and you became an assistant. You spend a year uh, getting tutelage and mentored and then you go back and finish and become an agent and we're still trying to figure out how to grow up baby agents aren't we we are uh we just went back to uh bringing them back off the street again as b10s uh so we're starting to get uh, privates and specialists um uh, into the unit as as we go forward there's so many questions i want to ask you about but this is uh, interesting to me when do you think you became a good agent and how much of that was driven by army training um, oof. I, I don't, I think as an, as an agent, you never learn everything, right? I think as an agent, you should always keep an open mind and always have that ability to learn no matter who it's from, from a private or to all the way up to a general or something. So I, the army, uh, I had some good mentors when I went to, um, uh, 165th, you know, we had uh, Mr. Narmi, we had Joe, Joe Garland there. Uh, 
Um, and then when I went to Redstone, I had um, Ed Toe, Jim Kane. Uh, so I had good mentorships as warrant officers, which led me to become a warrant officer. And then the Army training over the years, going to advanced courses to learn my job. Um, but I, I, today is I'm, I'm still learning as I as I'm an active agent. I still learn every day from somebody. Right. How much? OK, so how do you describe our job? Because it's such a I mean, the whole thing, the whole counterintelligence people focused field. How do you describe it? Um, I describe it as we are uh, federal agents who conduct uh, national security investigations and operations. Right. We're worried about terrorism espionage, treason, sabotage. Um, so if, when people ask me that, that's what we do. Um, so we we take initial reports. Uh, if there's something there that should be investigated, we open an investigation and we we do discrete investigations. We're not like um, CID or MPs or we don't go knocking on doors and, and, and try to uh, let everybody know it's an investigation going on. We try to keep it as discreet as possible. One, so we don't ruin the individual that's under investigation's reputation, right? Because you're doing an investigation to confirm or deny uh, the allegations. So we try to keep it as discreet as possible in case there's nothing there. And then when we go into Bosnia and we're out in the field collecting, trying to, confirm, we're still look, we're still doing counterintelligence, right? Oh, but absolutely. That's how, that's how different our field is. I mean, we're not even getting into bugs and and surveillance and counter counter surveillance and all these other things. But what the heck were we doing in Bosnia then? We were we were more of a force protection um, type for the the commander, right? Commander had uh, priority uh, priority intelligence requirements. Uh, where the, you know, if there was going to be an attack on the base or they were worried about people um, trying to sabotage or, or disrupt our mission. So what we were out there doing was collecting information to counter uh, the, the attempts by the people that didn't want Bosnia to become unified, right? So we were out there making sure the bad guys were um, identified and neutralized. Mike Wardy has been on the show a bunch of times as an author. He writes histories of things like Delta Company 165th deployment. And one of the things that I told him, I was pitching him the idea, and I'm like, look, this is a unique time in military history. We're going to a fully strategic counterintelligence force. Uh, we're not going to have interrogators anymore. And then all of a sudden, oh, by the way, we'll be armed with laptops, you know, and then and then portable hard drives and cameras that we can go into the field and take pictures. I know we always say cameras, but these are digital cameras, right? All these right. things, we were going to be writing reports literally like overnight, went from writing reports on a notepad to a, an iPad. I mean, for all intents and purposes, right? A, a laptop, right? I, talk about that time and that transition. Oh, it was, and, and he's, as you remember too, as you said, the interrogators were going away, but then they blended us, right? It, yeah. That's where the human collectors and the CI collectors came together and we formed a counterintelligence tactical human team. Right. Uh, so we had, so it, it was interesting. The equipment that we gave, it was still brand new. Like you said, laptops and trying to use a little satellite dish to, to, <laughs> to connect and it. <laughs> <laughs> and if there was a cloud in the sky, it wouldn't work. So you had to just, uh, so it was very, uh, it was very challenging. And then trying to find, because nobody knew really what we did and what we could do for them. We had to right. articulate, articulate that to the commanders. So we were always like, yeah, go sit your tent up over there. Right. They, they didn't know what to do with us. So it was, it was, it was challenging to get the commanders understanding what we do and, and then to support us as we were, you know, direct support to that combat commander that was going into Bosnia. This is the thing that I, the overall conversation on what do we wear on our arm to let people know how special we are, not just the special, we don't put this, put the special in special agent, but we are part law enforcement. We do have a badge, but if there is a badge of law enforcement that has less power than a counterintelligence badge, I don't know what it is. Cause I've literally pulled that thing out and had someone say, I don't care about that thing. Like, right. they don't they don't even know to respect it. They we can say you're enjoined to help me, which are the actual words that they say. But but no one no one believes you because we don't have a badge. I mean, you can go get a go to sapper school and learn how to blow things up and fences and stuff and stuff you probably never will use legitimately in combat. But you've got a tab and it says, hey, right. you know how to do this. You can be a combat medic. We can see who you are. Seals, 
Green Berets have a hat. We have nothing. We have well, that's, I, mean, I, I was never a big fan of flashing my badge ever as, as my during my career. And it, it and it's up to it's all per you know, as our job, it's all personality driven, right? It's how mm-hmm. you can articulate and show your value to that commander. Right. And you can't go in there and talk special agents speak to them. You have to talk army speak to them. And that's what one thing I would recommend to all our junior leaders as they're coming up, our NCOs and, and junior warrants is you're not special. You're still part of the army and you need to articulate what we bring to the fight to help that commander combat the enemy. This is a big thing. This is such a big thing because not every, so we had, I don't know what I remember is was 15 teams. So yeah, 15 teams, a variety of um, a, um, special agents. And like you said, interrogators, warrant officers, all these, these different people. And we had a, uh, uh, Regina Smith was our warrant officer, brand new warrant interrogator. She didn't know our job, right? I mean, right. we know about each other, but she had the power of, and I'm going to say this as gracefully as I can, but it's not very gracefully. She's a female, she's black, and then she was a, a, this early officer, right? So she had some 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 guts, you know, because you have to establish who you're going to be the rest of your career in that right. in that rank file, right? So she would stand up and she, at one point we'd work and you know how hard our job is physically. I mean, it's just never stops, you know, pre-mission, mission, post-mission. Right. Do we have time to sleep? But by the way, maybe we drank a lot, you know, <laughs> like, like it's, it's uh, not as easy as everybody uh, realizes. And so we were out sunning ourselves, just getting some sleep because we were going to work like a, basically like a swing shift that day, because we just would work like three days in a row. We were killing right. ourselves. And the chemical guys who had no job at all saw us sitting out there, me and my buddy, and we were sunning ourselves. And they're like, these guys aren't working. And they called us out and like in the uh, evening brief. And Miss Smith stood up there and she stood up and said, I'll take my guys and we'll leave right now. If you guys want to have better jobs, get better scores in your ass fabs. Look at the look, look at the boss. The right. boss looked at that guy and said, you got a problem with them? And it's like, nope. <laughs> and sat down. So she had a big ass that could be chewed on and it wouldn't matter, right? You couldn't right, do right. anything to her. But not every team had that. A lot of teams struggled and got sucked into things that are by reg against the law, right? They did. And and again, it it, you had a she was a good leader. She knew exactly how to fend off and protect her team. Uh, and and you know, as the army growing up in the army, it's you have good leaders, you have bad leaders, and unfortunately, sometimes they don't know the job or they just do what they're told and not fight for and articulate what they're supposed to do and what they can do for that, that those uh, commanders on, on the post that we had. And and, and then you bring up uh, us, you know, it's, um, we had NATO going in there, right? We had different countries coming in and Bosnia was the first time the German army has ever been out of Germany since world war two and on that mission. Right. So they were ready to light, they were ready to light people up. You go to a checkpoint, you, you better make sure that uh, uh, you had everything in line, be, or the Germans would get upset, right? So, yeah, yeah. But it's 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 funny how other, like us, when we go, the U.S. Army goes, and we're looking at where we're going to live, where the command post is going to be. You know, we're working with the Danes and the Brits, and and they were worried about where the bar was going to go mm-hmm. before they they, they were going to yeah. live. So it's a different mentality as you as you go through and deploy with other countries. For um, sure. Yeah. That's also, it's not the first time we did a, a joint and coalition deployment, but it was kind of opening a new era where it wasn't just like, you guys are going to handle this one thing. It's like, no, no, no. We're going to embed our counterintelligence agents with you. You know, like that, that was a different thing. Polish brigade, Swedish brigade, all these different things, different rules, different, com, you know, command environments, all that stuff. It gets really complex. And then, I'm just going to say it out loud, man. We were in no way prepared when we left. Germany. We had no idea. We had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. As you, as you remember, Colonel Vivon was in charge of the, yeah. the battalion as we were going in, and we, you know, he wanted to get the combat patch. We were all gung ho, uh, prepared. All we did was lay out our equipment three days a week. Right, we had to go to Darmstadt, make sure we had the tents and everything, but. We never focused on what the mission was going to be. So when we went in, it was mm-hmm. almost like we were making things up as we went. You know, we were mm-hmm. relying on our past experiences, our knowledge of the job uh, to get it done. And it, that that was a frustrating point, I think, for everybody in the 165th is we never prepared for the mission itself. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, and you think about it too, given how hard it was to get around, I don't know what, and, and I'm not trying to diminish Echo Company, the, the, the infantry guys, unit, but they should have been augmentees to our teams. They should have been. Because you think a, about how vulnerable we were, we could use a couple of hard-hitting ranger guys who could help right. us out, and we could cross-train them into something really cool, you know? Right. Yeah, we had a big bar on steel because, as you recall, when we first went in, everybody thought we were going to get shot at and stuff, and it was danger. So you had to have a four-vehicle convoy to get out, and we only had four people per team. So <laughs> it's like, what are we going to do? Yeah. You know, I remember going out the gate one night. We had uh, Air Force weather guy. We, we had a couple privates from an infantry battalion uh, just to fill out our vehicle so we could yeah. go out. And you you remind me of, you know, the, five nine, the 519 guys, the Lurse guys. As I was first walking into uh, the 165th compound there in Darmstadt, and the first sergeant had uh, those guys, and I didn't recognize it. I didn't know anything, right? I was just walking in brand new right. to the unit. They're all out in the parking lot in their front leaning rest position. And the first sergeant yelling, we'll be here all damn day until somebody tells me who threw that chair out the window. And I'm yeah. like thinking to myself, what did I just get myself into? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Going back to Miss Smith and the example of leadership. So I, what I learned from her was that you can take some ass chewing. I've been kicked off a lot of camps. And I, I'm talking as a civilian, as a contractor, you know, I'm never in the Army, but you know, pretty close. But when I was like a DA civilian, you're still in the army. You're just, you know, a little more right. untouchable. But I was kicked off. I kicked off a lot of camps because I would be honest with the commander. And I would say, look, this is what we do. You know, you want to <laughs> you want to you put me in a spot. Here's what I can do that nobody else can do. And they're like, oh, no, shit, go do that. And I'm like, I just need you to make sure you watch my head so no one else has to take it off. And then they, I learned how to speak commander in a way that allowed me yeah. to be valuable to them, right? But you had to learn how to do that. There's nothing sadder to me than seeing a bunch of intel guys that think they're doing great things and the commander has no idea who they are. But it's, we're kind of, sometimes we're kind of like our own worst enemy because we always like to overclassify things and we hang yeah. on to the information. Um, every, every deployment I went in or every, every base I go to now, I make sure I go in to find a senior intelligence officer. I brief the general and share the information that yeah. we, we gather to make, you know, again, this is what we bring to the fight, sir. And this is what I can do for you. And this is, and then you show them by informing them of any threats that are in the area. Yeah. Yeah. And then hopefully you're building your reading list too. So everybody's right. reading reports. Yeah. The other thing I learned in Bosnia was that um, everybody's focused on threat. In the case of Bosnia, it just, it wasn't the prime thing. It was like, can we find bad people? Okay, we can find bad people. Are they doing bad things? Well, they're not wanting to tell us about it. So what else can we find out? And so you look at the whole mission, right? And so when I, like right now, if I was to deploy the support battalion or brigade, I know like, I know what the commander wants. They want to close with and destroy the enemy. They want to protect the force. They want to teach and train. And then they want to enable their enablers so they can teach and train. Right. I can gather intel on all of those things. And nobody else does. And so it's just like gold all over the place. We are like, yep. hey, sir, hey, boss, you see this? This isn't working so good. What do you want to do about it? And then then they go forward and they, they can deal with it. And that's how you become relevant to a commander. And I can absolutely, I literally would take, and this will sound crazy, and I know you'll get it, but I would take the entire focus of the brigade and change it completely because they realized how much we were our own problem. Well, you as know? you were as you recall, Pete, as we were going into Bosnia, everybody thought the Serbians were the enemy, right? right. Everybody wanted to focus on the Serbs, yeah. and nobody was nobody was considering the Croats or the or the Bosnians themselves as threats. So as as you're, and when you go into a deployment area, like you, it's good to get outside the gate, but you have to. And it was insider threat before it was insider threat, the, the buzzword, right? So mm -hmm. you, you look inside the camp to make sure there's no threats before you start moving outside. Because uh, you want to ensure the troops on the base is where we're supposed to feel safe and uh, are protected right. before you, you know. Uh, so you had to you had to educate the commands that the Serbs weren't the only possible threat in the theater at that time. It's true, and and there was also all of that mixing of oh my mom's Bosnian but my dad's a Serb, you know. And you know, what do I do with that? Do I make that person a double agent on themselves? You know, I mean, it's, it's just, it was crazy when you started to realize that the other thing I learned about the ground truth. I'm like, OK, you go into this village and half the town, half the town is blown up. 
and you start to ask the questions and you realize just how complex this is. Sure, there was ethnic cleansing, but that was it was wholesale. It was like, hey, you're the wrong ethnicity here right. today in this village. And so you're getting smoked and your house is getting blown up. Right. You know, it was really, really complex. And we had no idea about that. None, not, not a bit. Now, because like we went back and said, we weren't prepared. We didn't get the information that we needed to. Excuse me. It's getting a super call on a super phone. Yeah. Works calling. <laughs> works calling. I'm supposed to be off, but works calling. Um, <laughs> uh, see, again, we didn't know the culture, right? We mm-hmm. should have had classes where we're, this is the culture of all three ethnicities that we're going to deal with. And this is what's going on. We, we almost had to do our own homework before we went yeah. in, in between yeah. where we're doing layout, equipment layout to make sure we had the, the right screwdriver for the Humvee. Um, and as I learned and, uh, and, and went through my career, that's the first thing I, you know, I mm-hmm. teach my young guys now is if we're, if we're doing an investigation and operation, we need to uh, understand our enemy. Right. We, how are we going to de- counter the enemy if we don't know what their TTPs are or what right. how they operate within the environment? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really it's a complex job. The other thing that kind of confounds our success on top of the fact of being almost completely un- unprepared. And by the way, uh, Larry Yukmanovich, who was a first sergeant in our unit, he did give us a, a basic briefing for maybe an hour or two right. on history of the Balkans. And it was great. It taught us a lot. One hour, maybe two tops, and that was it. You know. Well, I don't know if you remember this. They gave us. They told us to read the. the it was a book, the Ghost of the Balkans, a Balkan Ghost or something, and it was like a thousand pages. And it was so dry. If you wanted to sleep, you just start reading that book. <laughs> <laughs> and then not practical at all. Like, okay, I read that thing. Tell me what it means. Tell me what right. it means today. How do I do my job? You know. So the other thing about our field is that you can promote so fast because there's never enough of us. And so, like, we had this lady who became a warrant officer, and all she did was screw up when she was in the unit. I'm not going to say her name, but um, she had no idea how to leave. She had no idea how to do the job. Every Everywhere she went, she needed help to get done. And she just kept getting promoted. Right. And so you had all these people that literally did not know. And then also, look, you and I are people people. We can go down, like, where's the bar? I'll start there. Right? right. And we'll be fine. A lot of our people, they're awkward. They are not athletic. I mean, you know... We're the antithesis of what a CIA agent is. We can we could run, we could do push-ups, we could shoot, right. we could do shots, all that stuff. Most everybody's not like that. Yeah. So how do those folks develop other people? And then what kind of agents do they create? Or do I don't know. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? It's so hard to do this job well. It it, it is frustrating. And and you like I said, you get what you get, right? And sometimes you have good leaders, you have bad leaders. And as as you move up in the ranks, you have to recognize that. So if you have an NCO or junior warrant officer that's not um, doing what they're supposed to do, you, as a senior leader now, you have to take them underneath your wing and teach yeah. them how to do and be a leader. Because you're right, they, they're promoted so fast, they don't learn what the Army or being a leader is, is what it's like. So mm-hmm. you have to recognize it as a senior leader and, and take them and mentor them to be good leaders. Yeah. Um, and that's what I do. Every office I go to is, is I sit down with my NCOs. Uh, sometimes I get, I have a warrant or two in the in the office, and you sit down and this is the this is our goals. This is this is my my vision for the office, and we're gonna we're gonna do this together, right? We're in an, uh... A lot of the uh, the training I got as an E four from from the NCOs, and everybody's doing their best. But what I've learned over the over the years is that Delta Company was not a very good unit and the, the battalion as well you know like um, a couple of people are like hey i wish you were my soldier i would have gotten you out of that unit as fast as possible and over to something else right like we didn't recognize talent we didn't we didn't do uh, we just did so many things poorly so one of the things that they would always do and this i don't know why we weren't a, a, a line unit so i don't know why they were so obsessed with this but they were always worried about possession of your weapon and they would try to take it from you or they would threaten to do it. And they would think, like, where's your weapon? You know, kind of thing. And so uh, Sergeant Hatchko tried that with me once. And uh, he's like, if I can take your weapon from you, you're going to get an Article 15. And I said, if you come for my weapon, I'm going to butt stroke you with it and assume you're trying to kill me. So we'll see who wins. Right. 
And I'm an intimidating dude when I say that, you know? And so no one tried to take my weapon anymore. And I promise I would have butt stroked them. I would have yeah. said, hey, we've made a contract here. You're going to give me Article 15. You're going to get a broken nose before you can even start it because <laughs> you're not going to get a hold of my weapon. And that's not, that's to me, that's not being a leader. That's playing games, right? That's the thing, right? Yeah, right. it was the games. Yes. Yeah. Right, and, right. And we, and we, tr- and as a, and we're notorious as a, as counterintelligence agents, we try to eat our own. We, you know, we, we try to, uh, advance our careers, stepping on other people to get get ahead, right. right? And and that's a frustrating part. And I almost, um, I tell you, I was so frustrated with the one in sixty fifth on my third deployment to Bosnia. I, I was talking to CID. I'm like, as a warrant officer, can I switch over to CID? <laughs> um, right. Yeah. 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 And I'm 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 glad I didn't. I, I've had a great career as a counterintelligence agent. Still, uh, you know, still moving forward with that. Right. And I, I have another another eight years I think left them in in me and. Uh, but um, my vision is to, I want to train people to take my place, right? Because that's, yeah. that's what, as leaders, we should do is train those younger agents because we're not going to be around forever. Right. So I want, I want to feel good about myself, leaving Army counterintelligence in good hands yeah. as, these, as these young soldiers move up in, in rank and become leaders. To Dachko and Ms. Smith's credit, they forced Greg McGowan and I to do the job. You know, and so we went off the camp every day. We went out. We had to figure out how to drink and stay coherent enough to get back. We had to take notes. We had to write the reports. We had to do the interviews. We worked hard. And nobody knows that, though, right? I mean, the Army doesn't care. There's no, you know, okay, I've got a field reporting number. No one gives two shits about any of that stuff, right? And so reliably building a good agent is tough. I, I mean, I interviewed hundreds of people during that year. I mean, hundreds and hundreds. And I, I cut my teeth and I developed teeth and they got big and sharp and I could do the job. I still needed to learn a lot, but I was able to do it. But no one knows. Everybody thinks they're a great agent. Or everybody, everybody thinks they're a great agent. They think they're the best, right? But we can never prove it. You can say, oh, I went to Motsi and I went to FCIDIC and I went to Great Scales and I did all these things. Even that doesn't mean anything to me. I still don't respect someone else's game. That's part of that eating our own thing. But we also don't have that thing that says, this person, no shit is good. You can convince a commander to change the entire unit's direction. He's an asset. We, we never get to learn about that. And the better you are at doing that in the field, the more invisible you are to the rest of the army. Well, that's, a good, that's a good thing sometimes, right? You know, if, you, if you're seeking glory, counterintelligence is not the, not the MLS. <laughs> right. Because you're almost like the silent warrior, the, the guys behind the scenes pulling, right. pulling the strings. Yeah. Um, and you have to understand that. And, and some of our biggest um, issues that we have is agents go do all this great stuff, right? The, collecting the information. But it didn't happen unless you put it in a report and the mm-hmm. intelligence gets out to the, the whole intelligence community as a whole. And, and the and the commands that you're supporting. Um, so I think the gratification is if nothing happened on my watch, that was, I had a great assignment at that time. Right. That proves the negative. But right. then when you want to go do something else, and you're like, hey, I'm really good at this. How do you prove it? I mean, without, ahead of doing it, right? Like you come right. and you're like, hey, I'm really good at this. I'll be valuable to you. You know, how do you prove it? Because no one... No, no one knows. You, know? you go, you go, and we're like used car salesmen, right? That's uh-huh. how I, I always equated being a counterintelligence agent. You're, yeah. you're selling yourself everywhere you go, and you have yeah. to be good at articulating what you do and what, again, what you bring to that fight, and and what value added that you have. Mm. Uh, that, and if you can do that, that's a successful agent right there. You know. Uh, I had John Murray on the show. We had this very same conversation. I mean, we spend a lot of our time back channeling and working on the camp so that we can live on that camp. Cause literally they can fold us up and say, go away. Right. You know, Um, we're out there like, Hey, uh, we're not going to pull guard duty. We're not going to fill sandbags. We're not going to, not going to, not going to, but what you are going to do is give us an extra vehicle. um, And bodies. (laughs) bodies, Right. And we're going to give you some reports that we hope you read, you know, and, and all of a sudden you just look, we're valuable, but we got to prove it in the work that we do. And so then, how do you balance that on-camp stuff with the off-camp stuff and actually be a good collector and be able to have a nose for it? Because it's, I would say it's a calling to be a good field collector. Right. right. So when you collect that information, the value you bring is 
early warning to those commanders that are that are doing missions outside the gate too. Not writing a report, going face to face, sitting down with those line units and saying, "Hey, this is what we're seeing. Yeah. This is what we expect." Um, I, I remember a few times where we were going out, and I worked closely with those those guys, and we had a demonstration in Srebrenica. The Muslims were coming back for the first time, visiting graves, uh, and I was out in the crowd with the the, the the Serbians collecting information and having and relaying that to the, the soldiers on the ground. Saying, "Hey, that group over there is maybe causing trouble. They're they're, you know, forming up to do some. So that's how you bring value out. That's how you show that you earn your your keep on the on the post. Yeah, I'm not I'm not filling bags, sandbags. I'm not guarding, but I am I am value added and and giving you early warning system. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and by the way, we're going to be off the camp more than any other asset you have if that's valuable to you. You know, <laughs> it's like, right. We're going to be out there working to try to keep you guys alive. The uh, the asset, <laughs> my buddy Brad is checking in with Berlinery, Berlinery, which is you know you know what Berlinery is. Everybody is there internationally in Berlin, and everybody's spying on everybody else to include us spying on ourselves. And you know you get the Keystone Cops of collection. That's a it's a it's a term that Brad loves to bring up, and it's always fun when he does that. When you're out there trying to find the right information. It's rich, the wash, rinse, repeat over and over again. You might find nothing for days on end. And that puts you in a lot of, because you got to scour the area, right, to build this network. And I realized, I don't know, just a few years ago that, like, oh, my God, we were out. And, okay, we had an interpreter, but he was a guy who smoked. He was a Bosnian, basically, who had come back, who was in the Navy. And so you're like, here's a weapon. And he's like, what am I going to do with this thing? He could tie you a knot, right? He was a bosun's mate. And so we had a bosun's mate. You know, a W1 uh, Dachko, you know, and myself, we had two M16s, no radio in one of our vehicles, and a bunch of nine mils. And then you, I look around, and I'm like, anybody at any time can say, bad day for these guys right now. We were protected not by our guns, but by our, our charm. I mean, Absolutely. that's what I realized. Absolutely. Again, selling used cars, right? You yeah, get, people, yes. get people to love you so they don't shoot you. <laughs> Seriously, and not only did not only did uh, our not all our vehicles have weapons; they were soft top, oh, right? Humvees yeah. as well. So you you had no protection. So yeah, um, and, but you know, back then I was what twenty six years old, twenty five yeah. years old. I, I, no care yeah. I, I was invincible at that time. Yeah, totally. Yeah, we put, we put some wood sides up on our highway Humvee, you hey, know. But again, well, no radio, you know. Well, that was that was to stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cold. If that's true, the uh, the other thing about that whole deployment and that part of the job is someone like uh, well, we had Captain Norwood, and then we had uh, Captain Kleinsmith, and and Eric yep. is still a good friend, yep. but he. Those guys can't command us, even though they're our commander. They're one of our clients, but ultimately, we didn't pay much attention to what came out of the company. They were really irrelevant to us. They, they were because we were DS to those, you know, I think I was a 2-2 CAV, you know, then in 1st Armored Division another time. So I worked for 1st Armored Division. You know, um, I had I had a, a nightly meeting with General Nash at the time as the 1st Armored Division commander, mm -hmm. and I was just a force protection team making sure he was protected mm -hmm. going around right. um, Bosnia. So we, we would debrief him, see what he saw, and things like that. Yeah, but the company, all they were is for beans and bullets for us, right? They just made sure we, we had weapons and, and bullets to put into them. Well, it, maybe it was beans and bullets for you, but every time I went there, someone got mad at me because they didn't like my attitude or whatever. And I don't know why, like, they thought I had such a bad attitude, but, you know, this you'd show up and they're like, hey, we need you to do this. And I'm like, I'm not allowed to do anything, not even allowed to speak. <laughs> Tina said, don't talk to anybody and tell them if they if they talk to you and you don't talk, tell them I said that. And so I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to talk to you. And then I would just go do my business and then leave the company area because inevitably, I, one of my time, my promotion got held up because they got mad at me because when I came on to the camp, I didn't help with the change of command inventory. Oh, and I was selfish. And I'm like, that's not my job. That's yeah, not my yeah. job. Yeah. You know? So the, in spite of itself, we went out and did this great collection, though, because enough teams did go out and go, hey, we think this piece is holding. I mean, at least that's how I saw it. I mean, I agree, but, you know, and then, you know, working for the commands had, you know, the, the division command or, or infantry command that you're working for, 
it's like one day they come to my my office uh, that I had, and they go, all right, there was a big red arrow painted in the middle world. I want you to go out there and see what that means. I'm like, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> go out there. It's a big red arrow painted. It means go left. I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. And that was that was early on. So it, as as you as they learn how you can support them and what you actually do, those those silly tasks go away, right? Yeah. And they they understand once you once you get them going. And then, you know, with the company coming down, we had a lieutenant, brand new lieutenant come in and she was back in Germany and, and I was one of the first teams in. And she carried this whip antenna for the Syngars all the way from Germany to Bosnia and came to my tent and said, Mr. Whitlow, I brought this for you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is what I needed, a whip antenna. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the things that goes to our lack of being prepared, and I didn't know this at all. Like when we were, I didn't know this until, until Jason Wood told me, if you remember Jason, Jason yep. was a warrant officer for yep. these guys who don't know. And he was sort of a, a late or augmentee, if I remember. He was. Right. Yep. And so I saw him. Um, so, and you know this, I, I ended up by accident in a back at Wachuca, which is the home for spies. That's where we all learn, get our training. And I ended up because of someone else from the 165th who liked me. He's like, hey, come on over here with me. And I worked at this thing called the Counterintelligence Force Protection Source Operation Course. Yep. And so we went to Georgia on a mobile team thing. And Jason was there. And he's like, does your boss realize that you ran one of the only like legit source operations, two of them under the new regulation. Does he have any idea about this? And I'm like, I didn't know about, I mean, I knew I ran a source operation, but I didn't know how like unique that was because no one had bothered to tell me. Bert, like I didn't know idea until he, I'm like, Oh, actually, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a good thing. I'm working in source operations right now. Well, CIFSO uh, was the new buzzword, right? The army's, Color Intelligence was doing it for long before CIFSO came. They just changed the name. Somebody needed an OER bullet. Right. Uh, and so they changed the name to, there was a new buzzword. And I was, I was lucky enough uh, in between deployments to go back to the school and learn some of the new techniques they were teaching to then employ them when I went back to Bosnia. Um, uh, it was a good course. It, it taught, taught you a lot, but you're right. Nobody... We weren't calling them CIFSOs back then. We were just calling them source operations that yeah. we were collecting information right, and writing reports. Yeah. Well, and the other funny thing was, is uh, so here's how I got to Huachuca. I, I met another Army person. And we fell in love and we got married and she was signal. And so she got curtailed. And her curtailment, once we got officially married, her curtailment sucked me to Huachuca where her assignment was. And so I showed up. Basically, I, I did not have orders to go there on like maybe like Thanksgiving, going into Thanksgiving. Right. And then I'm in Huachuca on the 7th of December. So no one has any idea I'm coming. And I showed up and the guy's like, hey, I'm going to put you at headquarters for the 309th. That way no one messes with you because he was in E4. If I had right. come on the wrong day, it would have been somebody else. And they would have sent me somewhere horrible right. because that's what they did. So because that kid put me in the battalion and then Nancy – Richards, who was my boss later on, yeah. she's like, give me a little bit of time. I'm going to take over this course. I'm going to put you over there. But that is the impossible pass it took to get someone who just runs sources into the source course instead of like a default, like, hey, let's take 10% of you guys right now and go run this course right. for us. You know? Yeah. And, and and it was funny, too, is as we came back from Bosnia, because we were the first, first guys in and the 519 took our place and then we replaced the 519th again. It was funny that they go, okay, you have to go to Grafenvir to learn what's what Bosnia is about. I'm like, and we're sitting there in Grafenvir freezing our buns off because it's cold. Or right? oh, Holenfelds. Holenfelds. Cold, cold as heck in January in Holenfelds. You know, there's uh, ice on the tents and and they're telling us what to, you know, what to look out for. And a couple of my guys go, that's not correct. We started teaching the class because the people that were teaching us never went to Bosnia. They had no clue. They were just going off old information and yeah. they were, they were still talking about landmines and things like that. And we're like, no, no the threats that that's not the threat anymore. Yeah. The other funny thing was, is my original orders took me to the five nineteenth, and I'm like, okay, I'm an E four P you're putting me in an E four slot to a company that's coming here. I'm already here. And the guy's like, no, that's kind of messed up. All right, let me set you. So he sent me over to, I don't know, to Georgia, actually, I think it was. 
anyhow, but um, it's just funny how these things happen. And then so you you end up at the uh, at the CIPSO course. By the way, my other boss, the, the warrant officer, he he really didn't know and didn't care. I was there in his office to to because my wife was an IT person and we were trying to network the uh, the class. If you remember. And so he had no idea I was even capable. To him, I was an E5, and, and that was it. Um, that's how backwards and un... When I, so I left, that was my last full, full-time full uh, unit. When I left, the commander of... And granted, look, he's running a uh, AIT company, so it's the size of a battalion at that time. But um, he never even really called to say, hey, Pete, what can we do to get you to stay in or re-enlist, right? That's how... That's how easy it is to lose talent and not put it in the right place at the right time. I mean, I should have been at CIFSO. That was the right place to put me there. But it shouldn't have been luck. It right. should have been by design. And it should have been like, now that you've done this, let's get you, let's develop you and have you go somewhere else. And if that's happened to me, that's the norm. You, you bring up a good point. I think counterintelligence as a whole, we're bad at talent management. And we need to do a better job of keeping those talented people in the Army. and as you well as you know as well as i do is as you progress in your career those skills that you're learning are very valuable in the civilian world and we're we're losing a lot of people to the civilian world because we don't properly talent manage our and take care of our soldiers that are you know coming up through the ranks right right yeah well the other thing that happens also because you promote so fast you barely it's very easy to have very limited field experience, whether you're strategic or tactical, because you quickly end up running a platoon in ops somewhere. And you really, you might do your career and have maybe months, 24 months actually in the field doing field stuff. And yet you're considered an expert. And and in some ways you are, but in a lot of ways, they have no business telling anybody how to collect something. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, And, well, the good the good thing is um, is the ar- counterintelligence is reforming, and they're mm-hmm. coming out of the nineteen seventies and, and catching up to twenty twenty one, soon to be twenty twenty two. So uh, we're coming; they're forming an Army Counterintelligence Command. We're going to be almost like CID. We're going to have our own Stone Pipe Command. One Star is going to come in. Uh, so I'm I'm really excited for the future of counterintelligence. Um, <laughs> Developing that talent management, keeping the, the people that we need in, make sure that they're mentored in the right way, and, mm-hmm. and having those opportunities to actually do your job on a daily basis. Yeah. How do you uh, how do you manage the different styles of people that you need to do the job? You need the people, people. You definitely need the puzzle solvers, those brilliant people that can do analysis. I mean, I know I'm just going to guess you you don't need to do any analysis. Sure, you can do it, but you'd rather be out with a bunch of young guys collecting. You know, I mean, that's right, how right. we're wired. So how do you find the people and put them into the right track? Like, hey, this guy's such a weirdo, but let's go put him in, you know, on the on the technical side and have him doing lie detectors or any one of the other jobs that's like, you don't need to talk to people. You just need to go be, you know, this is your skill set. How do we do that better? At, as leaders, you have to identify those people, right? You have to identify the personality. So as a, I'm in charge of an office, I'm looking at the different talent I have across the board. And you give task out, see how they complete them, how they think. Are they linear? Are they yeah. you know, visual? And you have a person to come in, you know, almost all the new kids coming in and do IT, right? They know right. all the, I'm an old yes. dinosaur, pencil and pen, uh, paper. Um, you recognize that and then you sit down and, and guide them in the right direction. Because mm-hmm. as leaders, we know what the whole field of counterintelligence, what is it? Like you mentioned polygraph. We have cyber guys. Yeah. So you recognize they have a talent for a certain lane. Um, and then you push them that way, yeah. guide them that way yeah. uh, to, again, to build a force as a professional uh, counterintelligence. There were a number of us that were pretty physically inclined and uh, we're good at PT, that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that has saved my bacon a lot is that I can go into any special operations type team and everything, and I can I can put myself in there and become valuable and not be like that, like the prototypical nerdy guy who stays in there and it's like, no, 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 I can shoot straight. I can run fast. I'm not going to get tired. I'll be with yep. you. But when you do that, and, when, and this is for the audience, they have this thing called a murder board. You know, like, tell us what you know about source operations. And then I'll tell them what I know about source operations, and they shut the fuck up. Right. And so right. that's a difference where like 
I'm not inexperienced. Like this has got, we don't want to write these stupid reports. And I'm like, I have to write the reports. That's my job. Yeah. Don't write the report. I'll write it. I'll go get better information than you anyhow. And then the guy who's, who's the fox in terms of like special forces, he's like, I don't have to be the fox. <laughs> it's so great. But I mean, that's another aspect, right? Like how do we get these guys who are badass dudes who can go into the field and hang with the SEAL team? How do we get these guys to fuck out of the 165th and over into, into a group or into a support? Yeah, aspect under SOCOM. I mean, that's another part of it. It might hurt to lose that guy, but right. that's where they belong. Again, that that comes that goes back to being doing that talent management, right? Mm. Um, and then becoming a more of a professional counterintelligence profession is is recognizing people's capabilities and then placing them in the in the right place at the right time right. to to do that job. Okay, we've done a lot of time talking about the background stuff. I find this stuff fascinating, but let's pay the bill a little bit. Let's do some no shit there I was, you know, war, tour, war story type stuff. Like, what are some okay. of the crazy things that have happened to you? I know you got a bunch. Oh, uh, one of them was Bosnia. We're, we're uh, up in the Srebrenica area. We're, we're tooling around. We, you know, we go in, we ask the engineers what, what roads have been cleared, what roads are still mined, and they, they give us a map, and we're, we're, we're just fat, dumb, and happy in our Humvees driving along up in the backwoods of Shre- uh, near Shrebenica, and we come up to a, a you see a, a chain, and there's a little sign. We're like, "Oof!" Get out of the car, climb on top of the Humvee, look over, mine. We're on the wrong side. <laughs> We're on the wrong <laughs> side. Of the so we had to we had to carefully back up. You know, is it, yeah, that was a that was a that was a very interesting um, uh, time. That is a uh, that is percentage points on your um, you know on your because <laughs> that's going to give you PTSD whether you want it to or not like that's going to stick with you you know yeah that's and, a big thing and I was lucky enough uh, late in my career uh, I had the case of a lifetime uh, investigation mm-hmm. I had uh, there was a, a specialist Anderson who was up here in the, the Great Northwest um, and he and this was right around two thousand four. Um, when we were focused on terrorism and all that. So Specialist Anderson decided that he wanted to provide information to um, the enemy. Uh, so he was getting ready. He was he was a National Guard getting called up on the active duty. He um, was mad because he had to leave his family and he was being ac- activated. So he decided that he was going to reach out uh, mm-hmm. and, and provide details, uh, troop movement, weapons, uh, all that. Uh, and so the FBI brought that case to us and it was, a, they had a confidential informant that was non-testimonial. And for the audience, that means they're not going to go in front of a jury and, and testify. So you, so everything he brought, that person brought had to be proven in other means as from an investigation. And we were told in the beginning of this uh, middle of December that we had to February until they deployed to get this case done so we we had about 60 days or actually less than that about 35 days to to like do an investigation and so i mean we went the full gamut of our of our ci you know doing the investigation having sources provide information to us and ultimately he was sentenced to life in prison and, and is now uh, a guest at leavenworth uh at uh prison at Leavenworth, uh, Kansas. So yeah. that was like the, pen- the pinnacle of a CI guy, right? Cradle wow. the grave. You have, you get a mission 35 days. You have to prove this allegation. Um, it, it, that was like the, the best time I've ever had. Uh, we had a team, uh, the team worked diligently. We we're 12, 16 hours a day trying to prove mm. this, this individual was, was attempting to, um, provide information to the enemy. And that's what we, he finally was um, uh, put on trial for is aiding and abetting the enemy, um, Article 104. Yeah, that's fantastic, man. I mean, and that's super rare for the audience just to, it to is. actually to do that. It's because uh, normally the FBI takes that from you. You know, they, they, we, they do, but he was activated Title 10. That was mm-hmm. Army jurisdiction. We were mm-hmm. jointly, we were arm in arm with the FBI. They were there with right with us all along the way. And, and I tell you, the, the one thing, you know, going to several deployments, been shot at, you know, there's been mortar rounds going off. The scaredest I ever been was when I had to testify in the trial 
And I, it, what was going through my head is don't screw it up, Bert. Don't screw it up, Bert. Because it was be, test, you know, being cross examined it was probably the most craziest thing I ever experienced in my career is when they're hammering you on, on things, trying to get that their client off uh, of the yeah. charge. So what's one thing you'd want back? Like one, one of your mistakes, cause we all make them right. I mean, I, mean, I've, I definitely have, I've gotten people killed, you know? Hmm. One mistake I wish I could have back. You know, I, I can't really think of anything. I, I've, I've been a, my career has been, I've been fortunate in my career and I can't really think of a mistake that I had that, you know, like, man, eh, I wish I could do that over again. Um, well, don't, don't, don't think hard about it. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, and I, I guess I'm being a little more critical of myself. Like when you go out and you have that first meeting and you realize we didn't, I didn't have the first meeting. Yes, we had a meeting, but there's so much work that I didn't get done, you know, because right. I was distracted or whatever, or I bit really hard. You know, the thing I would tell young agents, especially in Iraq, is who's playing who, who's running who, who's the source here. Yep. And it was hard to get those guys, and I couldn't figure out how to get these. I had no authority, right? I wasn't in a leadership position, but I was in a mentoring position, but only if they allowed it, right? And that was, it was hard, and people were taking risks that they didn't need to take. And yes, we were being surveilled. But what are you going to do about a non-permissive environment? You're going to go set up counterintelligence or counter surveillance in a non-permissive environment? No, I mean it's. But they wanted to, you know. They they have a source of like, follow me to the site, and I'll show you where. I'm like, nope, not doing that either. You know, um, these people, we, Bert, these people were so bad. This like, oh, well, that's the other team's source, but we're going to go ahead and go with them anyhow. I'm like, no, <laughs> he goes camp to camp. You know, these yeah. are the things that I wish I had. I was more equipped. To deal with but i I just wasn't you know yeah yeah it's it's tough um where you have the leadership should should be protecting on that right Right. Uh, um and they should again like i always say i have fun going to work and if you stop learning this job it's probably time for you to retire because you can learn something new every day and people get blind and you have and as a leader, you have to be careful. As you know, as source operations, people tend to fall in love with their sources and believe oh, yeah. everything they, yeah. they say. And you and there's got to be an unbiased, filtered opinion that say, hey, look, you're being you're being played here. And this is yeah. why you're being played. And people have to have, you know, scratch that ego, throw that ego out to <laughs> listen and, and understand why you're why what's happening and why yeah. it's happening. If you can't cage that ego, ooh. no. You're yeah. gonna have a rough. You're gonna have a rough time in counterintelligence if you can't. It's cage, hard cage uh, in your 20s too to cage your it ego. Is. It is it's really, really, really tough. Hey, so you show up at counterintelligence force protection source operation course, and then you see me, and and, and I gotta say for that, it's like Bert and I know each other, but we were never like had a time to get close. Like we, you know, we were both we, new to our unit. We spent right. most of the time with our teams, you know, yeah. because we were doing other things. So, then, yeah. That was like your second family back then, right? Right. You spent so much time with them. Yeah, right, right, right. So we would spend time in a van driving to and from Hannah, but we're all just sleeping or whatever, you know? And so so Bert and I really aren't all that close, but we recognize each other and all that kind of thing. So when you get to SIFSO and you see me there, what are your thoughts? And then did I, did we interact? Do you remember at all? I don't remember uh, if I played a role for you or not. Um, I don't think you did. I, I go, it was like, I know that guy. I know him from somewhere. And then I think we, we, when we started talking, we, we started uh, reminiscing about 165th days. But as you know, as, as in the CIFSO, me being a trainee at the time and you being an instructor, yeah. the, the fraternization yeah. thing was, was really crazy. Right. Um, yeah. It was funny, though. And then a Bart came through, too. Bart Dats yeah. got my boss. And so to both of you guys, I know I said this. You don't know the first fucking thing about CIFSO, you know, because <laughs> it's funny because you just said about it. It's yeah. like. It's hilarious. What um, you have any questions for me or anything else in closing? I mean, it's been a really cool chat. I love I love talking about this stuff. But what do you what do you want to do with these last few minutes here? Oh, I just want to I want to tell I want to tell a quick story. Uh, as you know, coming back out of Bosnia, uh, the army, you know, we we were gone for a year. They they take us to this Tsar Hungary to uh, decompress. Right, we're there's a beer tent there waiting for everybody because technically you weren't supposed to drink for a year. Um, 
and I'm not going to go there against gen- general order number one. I'm not going to say, I'm mm-hmm. not going to confirm or deny violating general order number one. I'm not going to go there. But <laughs> this was the time for you, for you to unwind coming back from Bosnia, right? So you didn't go home, kiss the dog, beat the wife type of yeah. thing. Uh, so as the warrant officers, we were, we were the, like the courtesy patrol, making sure if somebody got too carried away, we'd take them home, put them to bed, make sure they didn't cause any trouble. So I this see. one night, uh, it was a bunch of warrants. Uh, me, uh, Steve Pilkington, um, and a couple other guys I can't remember, but there was always a, a young specialist. I won't say his name because he's still in the business. Uh, and But he always wanted to get a coin. That was his thing. I want to get a coin. I need a general's coin or something. So there was a general, the TACOM general was walking around the beer tent, going up to people, punching them in the chest, yes. and, then them, and then giving them a coin. So we went up to this young specialist who had a few beers in them and said, we, we're, we gather around him as warrant officers because we're always devious warrant officers, right? Yes. And we go, Sean, you go punch that guy. You'll get a coin. He goes, what? Yeah. So he starts stalking the general through the tent. Oh my God. All of a sudden, he jumps in front of the general, and he literally did punch him in the chest. And we're like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> <laughs> the general like kind of was stunned, punched him back, and said, "Hell yeah, here's your yeah. coin." And we're like, we're like "Yeah." And then Colonel Caniano was sitting there, white as a ghost, because he saw this all go down. Yeah. And the general goes, "Who's your commanding officer, soldier?" And he points to Colonel Caniano. <laughs> The general goes up there, and you know Colonel Caniano was the most wasn't the most fit individual no. uh, in the army. Yeah. And the general just uh, went up to him and came from like back from New York and just uh-huh. dead swearing it. And Colonel Caniano almost fell down and <laughs> and said, "That's a great soldier you have." So I, that's the one thing I always take away. That I thought I saw my career flash in front of my eyes when, right. when he actually went up and hit that general in the chest. We're like, "Oh, why would we do that?" <laughs> You know, that same thing happened to Fuller while we were deployed. And whoever that general was came up and he's like, I'm your soldier. And he blast, mm-hmm. right? And so Fuller, and for the audience, Fuller is built like an NFL player and he doesn't work out to be like that. He's 6'4, 260, just a massive dude. Big, so, big redhead, right? He was a big, big redhead. redhead. Yeah. yeah. Just the last guy in the world you'd want to pick a fight with because he's just all. He's bigger than Ray Lewis just walking around, right? Yeah. Yep. And so he's like, Iron Soldier. And he blasts. He blasts forward like, Iron Soldier. <sighs> and he took it as a, he's like, you punched me. I'm going to punch you back. And he's like, yes, yes, that's what I want. <laughs> the general like, lost his mind. He was so fired up that someone punched him back. <laughs> he was. He was having, that general was having a great old time going through the tent. Oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. I bet. I bet. All right. Well, listen, I really appreciate you doing this. It's a lot of fun to have you on and talk about all these things. And uh, I can't wait to do another one with you at some point. This was really cool. If anybody uh, has any questions, shoot them to me on the email side, peterbreakdownshow.com, and I'll, I'll talk to Bert coming back on. You're not going to see Bert anywhere else. So we were lucky to get him. Thank you so much for doing this. Stand I appreciate the, the offer, Pete. I, was, I had a great time, and I look forward to doing it again. <laughs>